Hello and welcome to Emerging Tech Horizons. I'm Arun Serafin, Deputy Director of the Emerging Technologies Institute, and I'm the guest host today, standing in for Dr. Mark Lewis. And I'm really happy to have with as my guest, Dr. Michael Fritzi, Senior Fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, responsible for microelectronics policy. His activities include work on uh, secure access strategies, support for needed legacy technologies, DOD innovation policy, and outreach to industry to strengthen the U.S. microelectronics industrial base. Before moving on to policy work, Dr. Fritzi spent 25 years doing real technical work in microelectronics research at multiple organizations, including MIT Lincoln Laboratory, the DARPA Microsystems Technologies Office, and the USC's Information Sciences Institute. Dr. Fritzi earned a PhD in physics from Brown University and an undergraduate degree from Lehigh. Thanks, Mike, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Arun. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to talk about microelectronics, all in the rage in the news these days with the passage of recent legislation. Can you tell us, tell us a little bit more about your background and how you've gotten into this work thinking about microelectronics and, and the CHIP factor? Happy to, happy to do that. Uh, um, as you mentioned in the bio, most of my career has been microelectronics research in support of various government initiatives. So MIT Lincoln is a FFRDC and most of the other, you know, DARPA and, and the Information Science Institute was doing heavy defense work. So I was doing research, electronics research in support of the defense mission. Um, so that's the technical part. I like to say my nerd background. And in the last seven plus years, I converted to policy where I use that background knowledge to develop, help develop strategies for the government, particularly DOD. Um, let's get to the CHIPS Act. CHIPS Act, I was a little bit of piece of that, was passed as part of the FY21 NDAA. And most recently, the Chips and Science Act passed and, uh, in August 2022. So what was the progression to get the CHIPS Act and the Chips and Science Act passed? And uh, what, what was the problem that uh, people were trying to solve with those two pieces of legislation? Yeah. Well, so there's a two-part question, Arun. One is the, the legislative progression, and the other is why, why do it? So with the legislative progression, of course, there's a difference between the um, appropriations part and the authorization part. So the authorization part came early and in a strong bipartisan manner. The appropriations part was in two pieces. The Senate passed it over a year ago in a strong bipartisan manner. And there was a long hiatus as the House considered what, how they want to uh, reconcile. So there was a lot of changes uh, that were made primarily to the sciences part, not really the chips part. So the appropriations the part piece stayed, was chips and science. Yes. And the authorization piece was chips. Right. Chips was the authorization piece and the actual appropriations vehicle was chips and science. So I think the House added a lot on the science end of things. Chips, I think, in a, except for the addition of the tax credits, not a whole lot of substantive changes were made in the actual chips piece of the legislation. So for those not super familiar with the details of what's in chips, how do you summarize it quickly? For well, the quick summary is it's basically two parts. One is it stimulates domestic production. So it, it earmarks about $38, $39 billion to stimulate domestic production. And that's production with the broad sense. It's not just fabs, but it's domestic production semiconductors to strengthen that domestically. $39 billion is set aside for that. And then there's a strong research part for long-term research excellence in the United States. And that's about $11 billion. So basically, and then there's a $2 billion, um, what's so-called core effort that the Department of Defense gets to execute. So that's chips in a nutshell, the three parts. So we've been thinking about microelectronics forever, arguably, DOD was one of the drivers for the industry in the first place, right? Dating back to the origins of the microelectronics industry. So why now for this major legislation? Why now for arguably a large investment in microelectronics? It's an important question because this is probably the largest in my career. I, I've lived through Semitech, but I think in real dollars, this is a more serious investment. What's Semitech? Oh, so I've lived through the Semitech public-private consortium in the 90s that started in the 90s. And that was driven by economic uh, competitive concerns with Japan. In this case, we're driven by two things. We're driven by economic competitiveness concerns with China, which has been making very large investments in domestic microelectronics capabilities. And that is coupled with the COVID-induced supply chain shortages that we've all lived through, including shortages for automotive and, and other critical uh, chips for, for critical infrastructure. So both of those things motivated Congress to open up their checkbook and the deal with the semiconductor industry from the point of view of industrial policy, which is something that's politically difficult. So they had to have compelling reasons to do it. And the compelling reasons were China, 
and supply chain issues, COVID supply chain issues. So when there's a lot of reporting about chips and there's discuss discussion of chips and science, it's sometimes hard to draw the connection between that and what DOD needs and what defense industry needs. So what's, how do I draw that connection? Yeah, it's great because it's not a direct uh, connection. One might say, well, why don't you just have defense companies do all this? Well, the reality is for advanced chips, almost all of them are made in commercial companies and in commercial foundries. So without, without secure guaranteed supply chains, and that means maybe not all domestic, but uh, you know, seriously domestic capabilities. Without that, defense can't access the parts that they need, or they may have security issues in accessing the parts that they need. So in order to get guaranteed access, having a strong semiconductor industry separate from the defense base is extremely important for defense because they, they draw their parts from the commercial industrial base. And it's preferable if we have either secure domestic sources or secure allied sources, that would be preferable. Possibly. And just to make clear, um, simplistically, what kinds of microelectronics is DOD using today? What will it be using in the future? Uh, is there anything that it's not using that it should be using? Well, DOD has a need for a very broad mix of part types. And we, I've been studying this with many colleagues for a long time. So be, between research, advanced uh, programs, and existing weapon systems, it's very broad. DOD needs a broad uh, spectrum of parts. But that being said, the majority of defense systems that are deployed use existing or, or legacy technology. So it's extremely important when we sustain those systems to have a solution where those kinds of parts are sustained over the long term. Because that's what impacts our current defense systems. That doesn't mean we don't need state of the art, we do. And we need to modernize more effectively and we need advanced digital. But the majority of defense systems, since they're in production and in deployment for decades, typically many decades, we need older technologies and we need a clear path to getting them continuing to get them for decades in a secure manner. So uh, CHIPS Act, CHIPS and Science Act, both signed into law. Uh, I suppose money has appeared now in the hands of multiple agencies. Like you said, the Act has these uh, pieces of developing capacity for production, tax credits, uh, there's research activities, educational workforce activities. Um, what are the big challenges that the government now faces to implement the actual legislation? Yeah, so there's a, a couple of uh, challenges. One is to get a critical mass. To me, the most important one is a critical mass. To really have a lasting, sustainable impact on the semiconductor business, even domestically, you need of the order of uh, 100 or $200 billion. And we know that from looking at our allies like South Korea and Taiwan and others who are strong in semis. That's the level of investment over five years that you need in order to make a significant uh, dent. But that's not the number that you that's said. That's not the number that I said. So uh, it needs to be structured. The CHIPS Act needs to be structured to attract commercial investment money so that the total is closer to the 100 to $200 billion. So it needs to be structured to make it very attractive for industry to co-invest with the government in order to hit that critical, uh, critical factor. The second challenge is efficiently dispersing the money. So you have money, but just throwing it at the wall is not going to help. You have to have a real strategy a real plan about prioritizing the various investments. And semiconductors are complex. There's many steps. There's fabrication, there's packaging, there's, there's design, there's many other steps. So how do you prioritize among all those competing priorities and get that money out where it will make the most difference? I think that's the other major challenge for the government. Who typically do you think would be receiving this money? Um, well, the heavily domestic. I think probably allied nations are probably uh, uh, in the in in the realm of possibility, but there's going to be a strong preference for domestic solutions. I'm sure that domestic fabs, ranging from the big state-of-the-art companies to the more custom uh, defense-oriented or, or uh, legacy-oriented technologies, will be receiving a big chunk. And then I would suspect that packaging and test or, uh, will, will be receiving a big chunk. And, and there are other areas as well, like perhaps you know design and IP and, and, and uh, electronic design audit. You know, it's a, it's a number of areas. I think probably in terms of real dollars, the fabs will probably get the largest piece. And um, if this goes uh, just like everything else in Washington and it's implemented perfectly correctly, <laughs> then what does the domestic semiconductor industry look like in five years, or 15 years, or 20 years? I think ideally, first I'd like to say that overall the United States is in a reasonably good position with semiconductors on the whole. If you take the whole industry, 
we still have a market share of about 50%, which is the envy of most countries on earth. So we're doing well. We know very well about how to run businesses. We are experiencing weaknesses in certain areas. And to my mind, the way it looks in five or 10 years is to strengthen the weaknesses that we have. Like What's much, an example of weakness? And I'll give you an example. Much of the fabrication of chips is in Asia. Right now. That is a potential supply chain weakness. Nearly all of the packaging and test capabilities that all the commercial companies do in the United States is in Asia. That's a potential supply chain weakness. So to my mind, even that we're, we're building on strength, but we're filling in some of those weak areas that can cause us a problem economically or with national security. Now, when you say Asia, are you saying China? Partly China. I think China has is, is made a lot of investments. They still have yet to um, uh, develop the fruit or you know, hit the targets that they want. China is still heavily dependent on the West for advanced chips, so their investments haven't yet made them uh, self-sufficient. But currently, when I say Ch uh, Asia, I mean primarily uh, places like Taiwan and South Korea, uh, the Samsung and TSMC, which produce the lion's share of, of chips that the United States uses, including the Defense Department, by the way. So some may say that those are friendly countries. And so then what is the driver then to make us stand up a domestic capability if some of this capability is already in the hands of friendly countries. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. They are friendly countries, but they're in a geopolitical, uh, challenging geopolitical zone right now. We, we all hear about all the news items, what goes on in the Taiwan Straits, all the alerts, the probing that China is doing of the defense shield that Taiwan has. Uh, uh, South Korea, you know, the tension with North Korea and the recent missile launches, for example. Uh, they're in a very geopolitically stressed area. So I think both countries would be motivated to try to diversify the location of their fabrication, just so they can mitigate the risks that they're facing geopolitically. So when you're talking about DOD's connection to all of this, you mentioned this earlier, is that you know, the De Department of Defense's systems often are using legacy microelectronics, many generations behind commercial state-of-the-art microelectronics. But a lot of the focus of chips is about very, very advanced microelectronics, very tiny devices that uh, arguably DOD doesn't use right now. So how do I make that connection between what's going on in chips and what DOD is doing today and what DOD needs to do in the future? I think that's a great, that's a great question. I'd like to just preface it with one example. I mean, we, we know a lot about the war in the Ukraine. The big weapon systems that made a, a big difference in the early days of that war were the Stingers and the Javelins. And I'd like to point out the Stingers were 80s vintage, the Javelins are 90s vintage. So think about the age of the chips in those systems and they, yet they're devastatingly effective on the battlefield. Right? So that's an example. But you asked me a specific question about the state of the art. I think when chips was first thought about, there was a heavy focus on nearly all state of the art because we understood the people thinking about the problem understood that we were losing the state-of-the-art domestic capability to Asia, especially TSMC. So they didn't want to see the only source of state-of-the-art coming from Asia, and that was motivating chips. As the chips legislation was being debated and reconciled, people appreciated the nature of the legacy technologies that we need for defense systems. And to, it, so much so that now a full third of the stimulus money for the uh, fabrication is now, uh, now devoted to existing legacy technology. So as CHIPS was debated, more and more realization came that we need to sustain current systems, not just for defense, but even in some areas like automotive and others, those are not state-of-the-art technologies either. So as CHIPS evolved, it got better to the sense that more monies were set for existing and, and legacy technologies to support them. I think at the moment, it's fully a third of the investments. Is on the it's legacy. It's supposed to go there to legacy and existing and legacy. Um, now, DOD, as I understand it, doesn't typically go out and buy its own microelectronics. It buys systems, buys a plane, and the plane carries, has microelectronics in it. So how does DOD then take advantage of what these, these advances are going to be? Yeah, it's, a, it's a tricky thing because part of, that, uh, uh, part of what you mentioned is the transparency issue. Right? Even DOD struggles to understand what the nature of the chip exposure is that they have, right? What kind of chips are in their systems? Because as you said, DOD buys systems, right? So it's hard for them to know exactly which technologies they need. But if they have more sources that are more secure, like potentially more domestic sources, and they have policy to favor domestic sources when possible, you will, they will achieve much better security. Because right now, in many cases, they have to go to overseas sources that may or may not be secure. 
And that's a growing threat to national security for, for defense. So if you were uh, Secretary of Defense for a day, what one or two things would you start doing now to take full advantage of what's going to come down the line and shift? I think, uh, I think the policy needs to be made to, to the extent of uh, requiring using more secure sources. And that can either be domestic preference, it can be a criteria for when do you use a fab, what do you define, clear definitions of what a secure source is. And I know that some of that is being worked right now in the department. But a clear definition of what is a secure source and when do you have to use secure sources. I think that's important because hopefully chips will allow us to have more domestic and more secure sources available to choose from. So one of the some of our viewers may have heard is trusted foundries. Yeah, how does that tie into this chips discussion? Well, it's part of the equation. I mean, historically, the trusted foundry came when the government's own fab at Fort Meade, and the government used to have a captive fab at Fort Meade, was getting difficult and expensive to upgrade. And so the government created what's called the trusted foundry, which was a relationship at the time with IBM to build secure chips with certain uh, security protocols built into the process line. That's been pretty effective over the course of years, despite the sale of IBM in 2015 to Global Foundries. But that contract was novated. And so the government still has a foundry source where they have some transparency in terms of what they're actually building in the future. And they have some secure protocols in order to do like ITAR and to do secure flows. So it's, it's a step in the right direction. How do you extend security to foundries that may be commercial? that may not be part of the trusted foundry family or that may be overseas in an allied country, that's the challenge that the department is working on now. And CHIPS is intended to help stand up more of those higher end domestic foundries, but now you're saying we have to overlay some of the concepts of the trusted piece. I think we need to use both. I think we need to build on what the trusted foundry has given us, which is a guaranteed source of CHIPS with some modicum of security. I'm not saying it's perfect. We need to build on that in order to give more variety, because that's a single foundry relationship, right? We need to build on that in order to access multiple foundries in, secure, in a secure way. And hopefully CHIPS will expand the universe of secure foundries that one can draw from. But we need policy of defining on what, when we use those. So what would you, you're very active in NDIA, active member of the Electronics Division, actively working with the Emerging Technologies Institute. What's your advice to member companies, whether they're big or small or universities, on how to become familiar with what's going on after CHIPS and Science and how to take advantage of some of the uh, programs coming out of CHIPS and Science. I think one of the big things that being very active with NDIA in general, not just ETRI, but also the Electronics Division, is uh, trying to give input. The government, can, not the government, the companies can give very good and useful input on standards for security. Right? This is something the government is wrestling with because it's a complex thing. I know automotive has standards for, for both security and safety, right? We need effective set of standards, and for industry can really step up and work with, in partnership with the government to develop a good set of standards that we can all agree on and implement in policy. Because unilaterally, either on the industry side or on the government side alone, is never effective. It has to be a partnership. And I think that's the single most important thing that industry can do is to be part of the standards conversation. So have we seen a reaction from other countries uh, to this recent legislation and to the funding that the government is providing? Have we seen a reaction from Europe? Have we seen a reaction from China? Yeah, it, actually it's fascinating because I think we were ahead in terms of getting this money um, authorized to be spent. So the, the fact that we recognize the problem and we're willing to authorize money, uh, we, we give credit to the United States for being ahead of things. That being said, with getting the money actually appropriated and out, our European allies and, and some of our Asian friends moved more quickly. So they have money flowing now. We're still writing solicitations and, and getting, getting ready to put solicitations on the street. In Europe and in Asia, money's already flowing to get fabs expanded in their domestic worlds. So they're a bit ahead of us in actually implementing chips-like legislation in their, in their sector. And how, what's the state of China's capability at these advanced microelectronics? Well, uh, I've mentioned, well, we all know that China has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in, in a big fund, so-called big fund, to strengthen their domestic production. But if you just look at it with a hard eye of, of reality, in state of the art, they're still extremely dependent on TSMC in the West. When you look at that. If you look at their imports, and these are public numbers, you can see they haven't really achieved anywhere close to the self-sufficiency they're targeting. 
So in state of the art, the West, and I'm talking TSMC, I'm talking Samsung and Intel, they absolutely dominate and, and China's dependent on them. However, at older nodes, at 200 millimeters, China's getting some credible capabilities. And that's something we need to watch because we could start inserting systems like that or chips like that into our critical infrastructure, causing security issues potentially. So China is getting stronger in the 200 millimeter and in some of their older technology areas. But they haven't yet shown to be competitive at the most state-of-the-art ones. So we touched on this earlier, but I want to circle back on how DOD is actually going to buy these systems. Um, so the DOD acquisition system is by no means perfect. Um, what are the challenges that you see within the way DOD buys that keeps them from taking advantage of these state-of-the-art micro? Well, we can talk, Arun, for hours about the acquisition system. I know you and I both know lots about it, but uh, and it, let's focus on one or two uh, issues here to, to, to simplify it. Um, obviously, flexibility is important, right? We know that people are locked into a rigid plan from the beginning of the program, and that's tricky when you have a development of a system. To define it from the beginning is a very, very tricky thing, and it, and it doesn't allow the program managers to exhibit flexibility when new technologies come out. So I think that's one thing. But I'd like to really circle back to an issue that I brought up before, and that's the development of standards, right? Today, uh, I think the only requirement that the DOD has is to use a trusted foundry if you have a so-called critical part. So if you have a critical custom part, a so-called ASIC or a custom chip, you're supposed to use a trusted foundry unless you can you know, get a waiver. We need to strengthen that and add more, more degrees of freedom to say, we need security for these types of parts, and here's the security standards that we need to utilize. We need to expand our, our definition of what a trusted chip is to be able to utilize these additional foundries that will be coming online, some of which are, have no connection to defense at all, they're just commercial. Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've seen the struggle for every emerging technology that the program, the DOD program that's happily existing, meeting its so-called requirements and living under its budget, uh, it's hard to find either the requirements driver to adopt the advanced technology, whether it's uh, energy technology or advanced microelectronics, it's hard to find the money. Um, does chips help with either of those kinds of issues? I don't think CHIPS is really an acquisition program. I think it's more of a capability program the way I see it. I think acquisition is a separate problem. Not that it's not important, it is important. And a lot of really thoughtful people understand the need to bring more flexibility into the early development stages of the technology. So I know we have very strict acquisition rules to protect the taxpayer dollars, and that's important. But we also need to have a, some, enough flexibility that program managers who understand the particular issues of a program can flex a little bit with new opportunities and can accept risks in order to get great performance advantages, for example. So working to make the acquisition system more flexible, I think, falls outside the realm of the CHIPS legislation. Mm -hmm. So it's called CHIPS and Science Act. CHIPS and Science. And, um, and DARPA, for example, has invested lots over the years in pushing the state of the art in microelectronics. So from the DOD research community's perspective, from the emerging technologies perspective, what's, what's in chips and science for the science-y part? Yeah, so the science-y parts are actually much larger. I think the entire bill is about $280 billion, and the chips part is about 52. So you can see that there's a lot in the sciences part. In fact, the sciences part dwarfs the, the chips legislation. Um, if I look at where it's being spent, a lot of it has to do with the earlier stages of research. A big chunk of that goes to the National Science Foundation for them to expand research in, in relevant areas of, of uh, high tech and actually get much more involved in both uh, transition of technologies and the security aspects of technology. So I potentially see a lot more research going on in, let's say, hardware security, uh, making, making the provenance of chips more transparent and um, more focus on technology development than they have historically have done. So NSF is the biggest beneficiary, but there are others. I know Department of Commerce has technology hubs that, that they need to set, that they're asked to set up in. So there, there are substantial, substantial investments in the sciences piece uh, that are going to change the world of how research happens in the, in the United States. And I think in, in the CHIPS authorization, as well as in CHIPS and science, there's also a creation of and funding for a DOD network of microelectronics research. Is yes. that right? Yes, there is. It's called the DOD Commons, 
And it is about a $2 billion effort over a period of about five years. And so the intent there is to form a series of prototyping centers around the country to work on DOD problems. They may be comms, they may be uh, radar related, it may be uh, radiation related, a number of DOD problems of interest. And they're going to have centers that uh, sort of couple a lot of the best academic and, and early stage thinking on things. But they're going to partner those centers with um, prototyping facilities to actually try to move those to a l later level of technological maturity. Do we have a sense of who those kinds of awards would go to or when those kinds of awards would start to come out? I think probably early next year. We're now sitting in November. The money has been recently allocated, but there's a timetable with that money. So I would think early next year, maybe January, maybe February at the latest, but early next year the solicitation should be coming out. And I think they will probably go to either university or nonprofit centers. I'm just guessing. I don't have consortia. Maybe. Yeah, consortia. It could be a nonprofit consortium. It could be a university center. Um, we have models of that with SRC and, and you know, the, the jump program that DARPA has done, the SRC and yeah. Semiconductor Research Corporation. So we have models for such consortia. I see a number of those, you know, six, seven of them around the country. The key will be coupling the research done at those consortia with credible prototyping capabilities and right. how they actually match the prototyping facilities with these research facilities. That'll be the key to the success of that program. And then turning it over eventually to the actual fabs for commercial production. That's the key. And they, they call it so-called, they call it the hubs, which are the research piece. And then the core is the prototyping fabs. So the connection between their core and their hubs is the key in the, in the, uh, common, in the DoD common. So we're going to close with one of our favorite themes here at Emerging Technologies Institute, which is workforce. You can't do any of this without the right kinds of workforce. So what would you say about the state of the microelectronics workforce now and where we need it to go and how chips and science is, in theory, going to help with that? Yeah, I think the government has a critical and absolutely important role in, in workforce here because a lot of the manufacturing of semis, not the design part, but a lot of the manufacturing of semis has migrated to Asia over the last 20 years. That being said, there's been less workforce demands here in this country to build credible fabs, which are one of the most complex construction projects uh, in the United States right now, actually on Earth right now. So to have the workforce for a substantial increase in activities in that area is not by, no, by any means guaranteed. So who are, the, who are the best investors? Companies can certainly help, but the government has the long-term horizon to help develop a workforce to show that you can have a credible career, be trained for that career, and to be aware that careers in this area are available and, and lucrative for, one, for one's lifetime and supporting one's family. So the government has a very, very important role in stimulating the workforce in this area. There's no way we can execute a $200 billion effort. I'm talking chips plus private investment. There's no way that can happen without a substantial increase of the semi workforce. And I don't just include PhDs when I say that. I include all levels of trades, specialized tradespeople, the plumbers, the electricians, all those people who help build a fab are critical. Yeah, and then you know you got two guys who got PhDs in electronics and electronic materials now sitting on chairs just talking about the <laughs> policy instead of actually doing the work. I suppose it just adds to the crisis. It might add to the crisis. We're maybe not helping in that no, regard. No, or... no. Well, Mike, I want to thank you for joining me in this conversation today, and I want to thank all our viewers for watching uh, Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. Thank you very much, Ruin. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.